Thank you so much. Welcome. I'll try not to screw up too much in my English, so I might yell out some Dutch word, but please correct me for the non-native speakers. Um, for those of you who do not know me, well, I, I had a great introduction, but I, uh, before I was a privacy officer at um, uh, KPN, I was a privacy officer at Dutch Railways. So I do know what a hassle it is uh, talking about privacy in big companies. Uh, so one of the things I have been uh, struggling with for some while is about the ethics of privacy in big companies. Because, you know, you have to make money. And that's just because otherwise you don't have a company anymore. But you also want to do good, and you want to do good in ways of privacy. So that's how this uh, lecture came to be about. Um, as I've saying, I've been doing this for quite some while. I've been doing this for like 20 years. And I started in the academia doing research on privacy and social networking sites, on identity and stuff like that. And uh, that was really great because the academics, uh, uh, they, they, they talk about future possibilities and possible threats to privacy and from a civil liberties standpoint. And, and that really has been valuable in my formation of how I practice uh, privacy in companies. Uh, but then again, uh, I've been doing this uh, uh, privacy uh, uh, consulting in companies for quite a while also. And I've started to notice something. Um, lately, I call it, we've been skipping a beat. And I'll tell you about what this beat is in a bit. Um, we have been overly focused when it comes to privacy governance and privacy compliance within companies and also uh, in all other aspects of life, I think. Uh, we have a hyper focus towards data protection. And you might think, well, that's not a, bi a bad thing, but I think that we're losing the bigger picture. If you're hyper focusing, you're losing everything else. Everything else becomes out of focus. And everything else is the bigger picture. What I've been doing in practice, and, and I think many of you who might be working with privacy uh, might uh, recognize it, you are stopping bullets coming at you. you know, there's a privacy problem, and you're trying to work your way around, and you're stopping the privacy problem. It's all about putting out fires. And you're never being able to look at the bigger picture. So what is this bigger picture about? This is where the good stuff starts. It is about the rights to privacy. And the right to privacy is a constitutional right. And a lot of people forget that this is a constitutional right. They say, well, it's about our data. It's, it's protecting our personal data. Yeah, of course, it's protecting our personal data. But that's just the tip of the inverse permit. The first, the biggest right you have as a citizen, as a customer, is the right to your private life. And derived from that right to private life is the right to informational privacy, to privacy on all the information that is there about you and that the machines you carry with you generate, that companies generate, that uh, 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 governments generate about you. Beneath that, there is data protection, protection of personal data. So it's just a little, eeny, teeny, tiny bit about privacy. So let's talk about this constitutional right to privacy. I've given you an example of a constitutional right, and I'm uh, using the European Convention on Human Rights. And why am I using this? Because this one is the one that is most used when we get into judicial procedures. The European Court on Human Rights has done a lot of really groundbreaking breaking work uh, the latest years on the Article 9. And what does the Article 9 say? It says, everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. That's a big thing to take in. So it protects you as a person. It protects your family, your right to family life. It also protects your home. Please or uh, anyone else can't just trespass in your home without a viable reason to be there. And in sometimes uh, they need a court mandate. Um, there shall be no interference by a public authority. Well, unless it is in accordance with the law and it is necessary in a democratic society. Well, there are, there are some weighing factors, but you see, I've highlighted some red parts. It's about morality. A lot of the uh, words you see here in this right to privacy are highly moral, as I say. There are rights where you weigh uh, your uh, certain uh, different kind of options. A uh, right to respect, the word respect says it all. What does that mean, respect? It's something we debate about. It's something that changes over the course of time. Privacy, what we consider to be private, changes over the course of time. Um, let me explain you some more. 
The constitutional rights to privacy, I'm going to say it again, is highly moral in and of itself. The constitutional rights to privacy protects our freedom and our autonomy in a democratic society. I did not make this up. Our, uh, uh, our lawgivers said this when they drafted the constitutional right to privacy. So it does protect freedom and autonomy. Those are moral values that we wish to uphold. What does it mean to be free? What does it mean to be an autonomous person? It's all supported by the right to privacy. Um, another aspect of the right to privacy uh, and the civil right to privacy is the reasonable expectations doctrine. And I don't know if any one of you has ever heard about it and it's, it, it started in the United States and they were thinking, well, what is the right to privacy and uh, what aspects do I have a right of privacy in what kind of situations? And they said, well, there might be situations where you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Now, I'll explain some more what that means. The first case used by uh, the European Court, and it might be really, really small letters for you, so I'll try and uh, explain it a bit further, but it's, it's in the Halford case. And what was the case? Uh, Ms. Halford was working for uh, the UK police, and uh, she was in a civil suit with the police because she felt she was being discriminated. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, there was all kinds of, of, of nasty things going on. Um, what the counterparty the police had done at that moment, they had tapped her uh, phone at home and her phone at work. So she went to the European Court for Human Rights and said it was a violation of my right to privacy. Well, and they said, um, I'm going to stand a bit front because it's small letters and I'm <coughs> nearly blind. Um, it is clear from its case law that telephone calls made from business premises as well as from the home may be covered by the notions of private life and correspondence within the meaning of Article 8. Well, that's the right to private life. There is no evidence of any warning having been given to Ms. Halford as a user of the internal telecommunication system that calls made on that system would be liable for interception. She would, the court considers, have had a reasonable expectation of privacy for such calls. The reasonable expectations of privacy. She was not warned that it could be intercepted. There was no law or legislation at that point for the interception of calls in the police office. So she had a reasonable expectation of privacy and she won the case. Another case. A lot of uh, the court cases surrounding privacy and the right to privacy is about weighing it against another constitutional right. And there are a lot of examples, but I thought, well, this one just popped into my mind when I was making this lecture. It's one of the cases of Naomi Campbell. And I think, well, I think in the early 2000s, she uh, went to a drug rehabilitation center for a cocaine addiction. And some photographers took some pictures when she walked out of there and put it, uh, published it in a magazine. And she said, well, that's a gross violation of my right to privacy. And so she went to court and she won. They said, well, this was a case where there was a certain, if you, even if you are a public figure, you have a right to privacy uh, uh, for, uh, for this kind of uh, uh, invasion. Um, and I've used this case because a couple of years later, it happened again. I think there was kind of a picture where she was snorting cocaine and someone took a picture. And then again, she went to court and she lost that battle. It was all, and that was all about weighing it. So I'm, uh, I'm just giving you the example to tell you it's not always clear cut where the buck will fall on the right to privacy or the freedom of press. But it's always weighing against the moment in time and what we think privacy is at that certain point in time. Um, a pressing social need. That means that um, you see the picture before I showed you about your Article 8 and said, well, there has to be a, a, a legal uh, a justification for an impeachment on the right to privacy, and it needs to be necessary in a democratic society. So that's the pressing social need doctrine that uh, a ju judicial uses when they talk about that. Um, I want to give you one example of that, and that's the Colon v. the Netherlands case. Uh, and what is that case about? Um, in Amsterdam, there were blocked off cordons in the early 2000s uh, where uh, the police had said, well, this is a high-risk area, and we're going to do preventative body searches for anyone who wants to enter this area. And uh, uh, Joseph Colon was a person who said, well, I do not want to participate in this, and he went to the high court, and he actually quite lost. 
And uh, here was uh, uh, the court's opinion. The court said the court held in particular that the relevant legislative framework contained sufficient guarantees against abuse, particularly the approval and supervision of the decision by the local council and the mayor's constitution with the public prosecutor and local police commander. The court further found the system effective in combating violent crime. So, wow. They said, well, there, there was a law and there were couple of mitigated measures and well it was very effective yeah of course it's very effective so there's uh, you know we might think otherwise and we might think well this was not justified but then again the court decided and you're going to get some more examples today of privacy cases where you might think uh, another direction in another direction and the court has uh, has judged it um, so there is also subsidiarity and proportionality weighing, uh, and that basically means uh, uh, have the judges uh, been doing their work good on a national level, and the other is uh, uh, if you have done this uh, in this manner, in this way, could you really not do it any uh, different, uh, meaning uh, less privacy invasive. So all these things I've been talking about, that's all about weighing and seeing what the circumstances are and what is right given the circumstances. So what is right? I do not know that. Um, I've been asking myself what is right and whenever I, I have a privacy case before me that's particularly broad. And um, I'm thinking that anyone who thinks about privacy in a business or in government uh, might be looking at the problem in different ways. Well, if you want to uh, know a little bit about ethical thinking, I'm telling you there are, uh, there are a couple of ways. Um, and there's one, the first is deontological way of looking at a problem. And it is behavior is either good or bad. And it doesn't matter whether you care whether it is good or bad or not, it's, it's irrelevant of your feelings. It is good or bad. The most, uh, 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 so well, the, the thing about it is, every, for instance, everyone deserves a fair trial. Um, and I've got one for you to maybe munch upon. Um, a couple of years ago, there was this man uh, who um, uh, had a child with his daughter. So incest. And he wanted to see that child. That, which was his son, but also his grandson. And he went to court, and uh, to the European court, uh, on the basis of Article 8, that he had a right to family life. And he wanted to see that child. You can think this is horrible, and he should not even be allowed to do that, but hey, everyone deserves a fair trial, even a pervert. Everyone, regardless of your age, or dis anything whatever you've done. That's deontological reasoning. Then there's a teleological reason, uh, a reasoning, and that is about the biggest societal benefit possible. And later on in this lecture, I will give you an example of that, one which I think is shocking, where the biggest societal benefit outweighs a person's uh, gross violation of his or her privacy. So there is a higher purpose which serves this special moral. Uh, it's about being good. Uh, and then there's the last one, consequential. Consequential reasoning is uh, the consequences of the conduct are the ultimate basis for any judgment about the rightness or wrongness of that conduct. And what it means is that whatever you do, it doesn't matter if you've reached your goal, that what you've done is okay. So that's a bit uh, difficult one, I think. But we'll get there when uh, we talk about uh, some of the examples I'm going to give you today. So. Now we're here. This is kind of the heart of why, what I do in my job when I think about privacy. Um, I got inspiration from a Dutch book, and it's called um, um, Het is uh, oké, okay, maar het deugt niet. Eh? Dus het mag wel, maar het deugt niet. Uh, it's legally uh, allowed, but it is not okay what you do. So, and I thought, well, that's not the only aspect that's at play when you talk about privacy. There are other cases where it's legally allowed and it is okay. Or there are uh, other instances where something is legally not allowed, but it might be okay. And then there's legally not allowed and not okay. So that's the, that's the clear cut. I thought, that, well, that's a nice quadrant. I can think uh, if I can use some of, uh, some of the cases I've seen uh, the last couple of years. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to you about legally allowed but not okay. 
I think most Dutch people know this one, the ING, it is called. Uh, what was uh, 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 the case? Um, ING, a Dutch banker, um, they wanted to do big data analysis on customer payment data. So they wanted to sniff in uh, uh, your uh, bank account uh, statements and they wanted to uh, uh, give you targeted advertisements. So use your uh, uh, payment data for commercial purposes. So it was legally allowed. They had all the, the, the stuff in the right places. They had consultants, their legal uh, 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 um, people, and they said, well, you have to ask them for permission, and that's okay, you have to be transparent, you have to put it in a privacy statement, but no one asked whether it was okay. They forgot to ask that. So, well, there was a big uproar, and uh, it actually never came to, came to be because of the big public uproar. So that's about morality. We all, as customers, felt, whoa, this is one step too far. You might be legally allowed to do that, but we do not think that is okay. So society came up and said it's not okay. Um, I think they d didn't really quite understand what was happening, because I read this article, and this is an article that was on uh, 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 FD, the financial uh, uh, paper in the Netherlands, and it said, well, we, we kind of, we're not going to do this right now because, well, you know, cost, benefit, it, it really doesn't add up at this moment. And I think you did not understand that people did not think that is okay. You are not listening to your customers. But then again, we'll see what happens. Um, another one, and I think this is one of the best examples I've seen in quite some while. Anyone knows that, m most people will know that a, a, a couple of years ago, someone from the Dutch tax department thought, well, if we are going to go and ask data from parking garages, they have a lot of information that we can combine and then we can see who is driving their leased uh, car uh, for private reasons when it is not allowed. So yeah, combining data and, and making analysis. So there was this uh, one company, SMS Parking, that said, no, 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 no. You are not getting our customers' data. And they went to court and they won because they just said, well, this is way out of uh, proportion, this is disproportional, you know, the check on privacy, and he said, well, this is not okay. There's no reasonable uh, uh, way w uh, where we can provide uh, this to you. So, you think so far so good, right? So, our tax department went in appeal, and in appeal, the higher court said, well, Actually, it is quite okay. They're in their legal rights. They, they have an Article 12 uh, uh, case where they say, ah, oh, you, you can ask all this data and it's for the, for the greater good and stuff like that. So you see, greater good. Um, it's okay. So you see, you're shifting from not okay in first instance to okay, and legally okay in the second instance. All the while, all of society would, I think, say, ooh, this does not feel good. We were there already. So, not too long ago, there was this article in The Correspondent, and uh, Hans Blokpoel, uh, the VP of the tax department, he said so himself. Well, even if it is legally allowed, I kind of think that this was crossing a line. So you see, from legally not allowed to legally allowed to, it's legally allowed, and it's really not okay. So they stopped this. They are doing all kinds of other stuff, but in this case, you get the whole spectrum. Yeah, everyone's laughing. I know they're doing all kinds of other shit. I'm not even going to touch that subject right now. Don't laugh too hard. They got your data too. The other one, something that's legally not allowed and not okay. So this is kind of the easy category, you know? It's like Facebook. Recently, our Dutch Data Protection uh, Authority uh, did some research into uh, Facebook's uh, data handling practices, and they were not the only one. Uh, French also did it, Spain did it. There's, there's a lot of uh, data protection agencies throughout Europe researching Facebook, and they're, they're getting fine after fine after fine. And so, ah, finally, it, it took them a while, but they're doing it. And in this particular instance, they said, Facebook, you are processing very sensitive data about sexual preferences and you do not have explicit consent. Stop that. So, okay, uh, I can tell you, they're not even doing that right, you know? Because when I turned 40, I got all these advertisements about, wow, 
you're 40 and go to this dating site. You must be very lonely because you're single. They had that right. I was single at that time. And then here's all these heterosexual kind of, I'm like, heterosexual? <laughs> I liked every buy page on Facebook. I put rainbows and unicorns everywhere and I like the rainbows and I, uh, every, I'm, I'm a member of every LGBTQI community and I think, okay, so you're doing it and you're not even doing it right. So I, uh, that kind of pissed me off actually. Well, to be a whole woman when you're 40 and you're single, you should not be single and you have to have certain male body parts in your body to feel whole. Ooh, ah, stop that. So about that. Uh, that's, that's the first, legally not okay, and uh, legally not allowed, and not okay. The second, and maybe you've heard of this, and this is about Evernote. They had this big plan, where, and where I thought, well, we might amp up our security run, uh, around surrounding our, our, our services, and I said, well, we, we are changing our privacy policy. Uh, some of our people, not all of them, mind you, some of our people are going to read your notes because that's good for you. And, they, they, uh, and it was like the whole Evernote user base exploded. You are going to do what? You're going to read my private notes? You know, it's like correspondence is part of the rights to privacy, at least in European doctrine. This is an American company that's a bit more difficult. As you, as you know, the Americans do not have a constitutional right to privacy. Uh, they got some privacy protection, but not, not a constitutional right uh, like we have in the European Union. So uh, then again, the whole base exploded. And after that, I think like two days after that, they said, well, as a result of feedback from you, hey, they did listen to the customer, uh, our customers, we have decided to withdraw the changes we announced in this post. Okay, wow, they listened and they kind of understood. Uh, not really. They said, Evernote employees do not and will not read your notes without your express permission. Yeah, that's legally allowed but not okay. You know, guys, do not read the contents of messages. That's never okay and never allowed, not even with explicit consent. So, we're here to really not allowed, but okay. And this is actually the most difficult shifting positions kind of part of my quadrant. I do not actually quite know for sure whether this is legally not allowed and okay, because it might not be okay, and it might depend on how you look at the case. You know, you remember all the morality points of view, where you say the greater good, or everyone deserves a fair trial, uh, or you're looking at the result, that's what counts and not the way how you got there. That's all. Um, you might have different perspectives that lead to a different outcome on these cases. Well, the first one is cloud control type of applications. Why is it here? You think, well, that's everywhere right, right now. Yeah, that is everywhere right now. And uh, in some cases, it is legally allowed. In some cases, not. You see, our Dutch Data Protection Authority is claiming in more and more instances that it is not legal. And uh, there is a bit of a, a difficult shift. Uh, if you're a telecommunications company, where I work, you have a specialized uh, uh, legal uh, uh, rules on uh, how you can manage traffic data. And that's in our, in our telecommunications law. And it's chapter 11 for those interested and want to read it. I would not do it. But if you want to read it, chapter 11. And what it says over there is that there are two grounds, if you are a telecommunications operator, uh, for using uh, uh, the traffic data, which you would have to use if you want to uh, uh, do live services surrounding uh, traffic uh, 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 crowd control. Two grounds if you do it anonymously, or if you get consent. Okay, so I think Bill already said it, anonymity is dead. I think uh, some other guys might have said it before and some girls might have said it also. Uh, but yeah, our Dutch Data Protection Agency is uh, uh, almost on the verge of saying it. Um, while I was working at the Dutch Railways, we were in talks with the Data Protection Agency for three years on how we could technically viable uh, um, use our uh, big data pool to make commercial analysis and to do it anonymously. Three years didn't work out. Long story, maybe I'll tell another time. Um, not so long ago, they came to KPN 
and it was the ITV uh, uh, um, research, and uh, it, it's also publicated the report, published uh, the report from a Data Protection Agency, so you can read what that was about, but to sum it up, um, they said uh, um, if you want to uh, um, process data and you want to do it anonymously, you have to lose your source. That's rather difficult when you're doing it live. I don't know how to do it. Maybe one of you guys know, knows how to do it, so approach me afterwards. But that's rather difficult. So you're coming towards consent. Well, how are you going to do consent in life? Crowd control situations. You can't ask it years or months beforehand, like, oh, well, you're coming, uh, becoming a customer of us, and here uh, you give us consent to track you whenever you might be in an area where we might use crowd control in the future. That's not legally viable, and that's not con what consent is about. So I do not know. I do not have the answer. Um, why I think this is one th uh, thing we have to talk about, and that is uh, because if you're not a telecommunications company, you have to uphold the Dutch Data Protection Act, the VBP, uh, or from so on, uh, the GDPR, and you do not have the specialized uh, legislation, and you have six different grounds and, uh, uh, to, to process these data, and one of them uh, uh, is that you uh, might have a legitimate business interest to, for doing so. Uh, and I'm not going to go into legal details, but that opens up a whole big field of possibilities for crowd control, live crowd control type of, type of applications. So, okay, that's one for you to munch over. I, I hope I was able to bring it forward, but please come uh, towards me uh, in, in the coffee break if you want to hear about this some more, or if you have really good ideas about anonymity. Um, another one of these shifting positions fields is predictive genetic testing. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I do that sometimes when I, when I lecture. Um, in 2014, I came back from a vacation in Cape Verde, and I had to make a stop and layover in between in Gambia. I got coughed upon by someone, and I got really, really sick, like big sick. Uh, I was sick for a year. And there was four months was 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 terrible, and and I I, I was uh, nauseated all the time. My heart stopped functioning, and my, my kidneys didn't work well. So, but then again, eh, it was okay. But one of the things that uh, uh, kept with me is that, that my immune system has got a bit of a bump. It attacks everything. It had to fight really hard, and I've got. Uh, some severe allergies uh, uh, as a result of that. And I have to use this one, this inhaler, three times a day, and it's with steroids. And I had to uh, take some prednisone, and I, I, I gained 10 kilos, you know, for a woman, 10 kilos. I know it's, it's, really, it's really tough, and I'm not losing them. But then again, that's maybe a vanity thing, but I have to use this three times a day, and it's steroids, and it's not good for your body, but I can breathe. And there's a lot of side effects, too. For one, if you breathe it in, it's really bad for your teeth. The other one is, all the excess weight is staying on me because it's steroids, and anyone who's ever had steroids know, know the weight is still on your body. That's a health hazard in, it, in and of itself. Predictive genetic testing. If you were allowed to do some genetic research, you could then, uh, they're vis envisioning this, uh, work on personalized medicine. So you could really bring the medicine to a specific point in the body. It doesn't have to go through my mouth. But you could put it directly into my lungs. The side effects would get less. And you could tailor it to my body so you could get better medicine and less side effects. So that's, that's a very, very good personal but also societal need. The greater good for me as an individual and maybe also for our society. But then again, you would be need to uh, breaking uh, a medical privacy for a lot of that stuff, so it's not allowed uh, at this moment. There's there's there, there's some instances where you can do it, but not on this big of a scale. So, is this okay? Do we want this? Do we not want this? This is highly ethical thinking about breaking a right to privacy, maybe for the right purpose. <coughs> so now, I seriously um, am going to ask you to do something. I want you to close your eyes, please. You're all closed. Think about the last time you had sex. 
Are you picturing it in your mind? I know for some, maybe it is an hour ago or an hour and a half. For, for another, it might be a little bit longer, but you are picturing it, right? You had fun. It was really good. It was awesome. Open your eyes. It was filmed and it was put on Facebook. And all your colleagues and your family, your mother, your brother, everyone saw you having sex. And for some of you, it might be just the vanilla kind of stuff. And it might be a bit more kinky. But anyway, everyone saw you having sex. That feels horrible, right? So there was this case about a girl, Chantal. And she had this happen to her. And she went to court because she wanted to know who put that information about her on Facebook. And she knew it had to be someone from her school, the ROC, West Brabant. So she went to court and she said, well, judge, we want to know who this person is. So please do uh, 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 give us a court order to look through the data to identify this person. And she was denied this. And the basic question was, what is more important, that Chantal uit Werkendam, that she knows who the culprit is, or to protect the privacy of 2,500 uh, students and teachers? I think that was not a fair question. And I'll tell you why. If you do not have this already, I think you should buy it. It's the next Linda edition from July. You really need to buy it. There's, there's like these awesome hackers in there. I saw some, some of them walking around here. But there are also stories about women who've been a victim of revenge porn. And there's some interviews in there. And there, I'll try to translate because it's in Dutch, uh, of course. And um, there's one, uh, Melissa. And she was the girl who had some body part of Dave Rulfink. And she had a bit of an oral conversation with it. And it was filmed and put online. So. She said, after the film went viral, I was afraid to go outside. I got severe eating disorder. I couldn't stop eating, and I gained 20 kilos. I decided to run away to Austria. She was so afraid to be in the Netherlands that she went away. That does not weigh up the 2,500 people, I think. Then there's another story, which I want to share with you. Manon Thomas, she's a Dutch TV presenter, at least not anymore, but she used to be. And she had a fit with her neighbor, and uh, his dog was shitting on the lawn, and she was saying something about it. And as a revenge action, he uh, broke into her server room and uh, stole some personal private porn. So maybe not like film it yourself, might be a good idea. Anyway, uh, what she said, and she had a family, and she said, for years, we were afraid to go out to dinner to a restaurant with our family. I've had to uh, stop my company, because I went bankrupt. And people uh, from politics, which I was coaching at the time, they sent flowers and perfume, but they said, I'm sorry, honey, we can't be seen with you anymore. That's like kicking the victim when the victim is down. This does not seem fair to me. And this is a perspective which I think is lacking in our courts today. And it is up to us to bring that perspective there. Because I think that someone should have whispered in the ear of the judge in a Chantal case, you know, there's something like forensic IT research. And you get one really good guy and you put an IT auditor next to him. It's like the four eye principle. They know what to look for. They know which time frame to look for. They can get the data. And they can, uh, I, maybe you've got another opinion, but I, I would love to hear it about that. So you remember the quadrant where I started from? There's still one left, you know? It's the holy grail of privacy cases. And I could do a lot of them with you. It's the legally allowed and OK. Um, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to do one. Uh, and I'm not going to do it about the Dutch railways or KPN. That would be way too easy. And I, I don't like to do that. Because I found one where I think uh, uh, illustrates that it is able to do a lot with big data. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not only legally allowed, but also OK. 
I don't know if you've heard of it, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Delta Lloyd, an insurance company, they are using big data to search for stolen items. So if your gar car gets stolen, you're really, really, really pissed off, right? And you want the, uh, the, the car back and you want someone who, who, who stole your stuff to be caught, etc. So they were together with a tech company and they developed uh, Sherlock. And yeah, okay, uh, maybe a bit of a corny name, but Sherlock searches and crawls the internet for information about that stolen car so they can put in a certain specific about uh, 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 type of uh, 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 um, tires you have underneath it, uh, uh, what color is uh, the seat in the front, is there a rip it tear, uh, something like that. There's very specific details in which they can retrieve the stolen goods. So they find a lot, found a lot of stuff and they found that uh, it saved them a lot of money and there were a lot of happy customers who got their, uh, their stuff back. But that's not all they do. They also were able, uh, when they uh, started using it for a bit longer, to see patterns. Uh, they saw patterns in crime and they could predict crime, pre-crime of sorts. Uh, but one of the things was they noticed that uh, um, a lot of Land Rovers were stolen uh, in, in a specific time period and uh, they noticed that it was uh, a security flaw. So they uh, uh, contacted Land Rover and they said, well, if you change this, then uh, your cars might not get stolen and your customers might be a lot happier. So they actually did this and yeah, stolen vehicles from Range Rover, uh, it, that dropped significantly. So I think there's a case where there's a big societal benefit, you know, less crime. Personal benefit, you get your stuff back when it's stolen. Uh, there's a commercial benefit, you know, uh, insurance premiums could be lowered and you don't have to pay out a lot if, you're, if the stuff is retrieved. Uh, and there's a small privacy impact because it's, it's about stuff, uh, you know, and, and uh, you may, maybe there's, there's a privacy impact for the perpetrators, but I think we might want to value that a little less than uh, the persons whose uh, stuff were stolen or victims in other cases. So I think this is a case where everything comes together. It's legally allowed and it's okay. Um, to top it off, I really, really am asking everyone here to stop focusing on the details. It is really good, you know, to uh, start looking at personal data and how you process it, uh, process it within uh, companies and within governments and uh, to, to pay attention to that. But sometimes you just have to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Are we doing this for the right reasons? Is what we are doing still okay? Do we really want to do this? In the end, you will lose customers. You know, it will happen. Am I doing the right thing? And what am I protecting? You know, you want to make money, but at what cost? Ask the hard questions. And to top it off, if you have a privacy office, have a really kick-ass privacy office. And this is the last slide, and this is my team. And I'm really incredibly proud of, uh, of them. But why does this work? Because it's a multidisciplinary team. There's someone here in the audience, but I'll, I'll not point him out. He doesn't like it, I know. <laughs> but he's sitting here in the front. That's this one. If you see him in coffee, it's Dennis. He's our, our, our technical genius, and he does all kinds of, of technical stuff for us in the privacy office, and it's really good to have a technical person in our privacy office. Then there here is JP, Jean-Paul van der Linden. And uh, he has a marketing background, so he knows commercial thinking. That's also invaluable, because that's where a lot of your so-called arch enemies are if you are a privacy officer. Then here we have Jeroen Jonge Nelen, and uh, he has a, a, a background in, in legal business. Uh, uh, um, I don't know what, what's, the, what's a good translation, but actually he has worked for a long time at KPN. Uh, but he has also uh, been the person who's giving a been giving a lot of privacy advice throughout the year. So he's got, he's got our memory of privacy advice. And then last but not least, it's Jennifer Weisman kok And she has program management background. And that's invaluable if you have to implement new legislation like the GDPR or the e-privacy directive. So that's it for me. And I hope you have learned something and I hope I've been a bit clear. Do the right thing. <laughs>